I honestly, I cannot believe that I am about to say this because I have said it almost every weekend for the last two and a half years, but this weekend will be the last time. Grab your Bible and open it with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Let's go to chapter 28, and it is so wild to me that this here, this weekend, is our last study in the Gospel of Matthew. And honestly, it has been such a joy for me to study this book and to be able to teach it to you guys every week. And at the same exact time, I can honestly say that I am so stoked to start the book of Philippians next weekend. I mean, we're not going to take a break and talk about dating. We're not going to do any kind of special series. We're just moving straight from one book of the Bible to the next book of the Bible because that is the best way to grow the church. As the word goes, the church grows. And so if we want to see God make more disciples, let's just keep on studying the next verse and let's understand what God has said in his word. And tonight, as we study God's word, we're going to talk about a common human experience. And we're going to talk about the feeling of loneliness. Now, I don't need you to raise your hand here tonight, but if I asked who feels lonely at times, I'm sure that almost every hand in the room would go up. As a matter of fact, I recently heard a funny story. One of our small group leaders shared this with me. They were hanging out with a student one day, and while they were hanging out, the small group leader's spouse called them. And after the uh, small group leader hung up the phone with their spouse, the student said, Ugh, just so jealous. And the leader said, uh, why? And the student said, I can't wait to be married. I just can't wait to never feel lonely again. And the leader responded by laughing and said, you think because I'm married, I never feel lonely? And the student was like, what? Are you serious? The feeling of loneliness, it's, it's real. And at the same time, I'm here to remind you of something that we often say at United, that feelings are real, but they aren't always reliable. Just because you feel alone doesn't mean you are alone. So what do we do with our feelings of loneliness. Well, what we do is we turn to the truth of God's word and we choose to trust in the truth of God's word. And when it comes to the feelings of loneliness, there might be no better truth for us to turn to than right here in Matthew 28. So let's read the passage beginning in verse 16. Follow along as I go down to verse 20. It says this, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now we began studying this passage two weeks ago and it is honestly perfect timing. And one of the reasons why it's perfect timing is because this summer here at United, we just finished up an epic missions week. And at that missions week, we saw God save, at least we heard about seven different people professing repentance and faith in the gospel. And that was because some of you We're really trying to live your life on mission, praying for God to save, inviting your friends to come to church, sharing the gospel after the messages at all of our events. The other reason why this passage feels like it's such perfect timing is because if you have not already, you're about to, it feels like this is the season here at United where everyone's going back to school. And I'm praying that God will and has been using these sermons to encourage you to live your life on a mission to make disciples. Because you're not going back to school. You're going back to one of the mission fields where God has sovereignly chosen to place you for the purpose of living on mission for the glory of his name. So two weeks ago, if you look back at Matthew 28, we learned about the authority of Jesus. 
In verse 18, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And we understood, or we we talked about what does that mean that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And we saw that because of Jesus' perfect obedience to his Father, well, God has exalted him and made him the name above all names. And we talked about how that name that the Father has given to Jesus is Lord, which means that he's the master, which means that he's the one who has all of the authority. And it's because of the authority that he has, we should go and obey the commands that he gives. And so if you're here last week, we talked about the command, the command in verse 19 to go therefore and make disciples. And we learned that souls need to be saved. And because souls need to be saved, we need to reach them with the gospel. We learned that Christians need to be taught. And because Christians need to be taught, we need to invite others into our lives and we need to teach them how to obey God's word with wherever they're at in whatever season of life they find themselves in. And we also learned that disciples need to go. And so we've got to learn how to work together to make more disciples with one another. Well, at the end of this passage... At the end of all of that, after we get the authority, after we see the command, we get a precious promise. And here Jesus is giving it to the disciples who are some doubting and some worshiping. And he says it there on that mountain in Galilee. It's at the end of verse 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so here's what I want you to write down at the top of your notes. This is a quote that you could write down here tonight that I want to encourage you to start thinking, precious is the promise of his presence. This promise of his presence should be, and it is, very precious to a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now that promise is precious for many reasons, but I can think of two in particular that I want to talk about for just a couple of minutes. One is the disciples are greatly disappointed, and the reason why is because Jesus is leaving. Now the reason why the disciples are disappointed because Jesus is leaving is because, well, they love him. They just spent the past three, maybe three and a half years of their lives following him around, going where he goes, doing what he does, watching everything about his life. And now all of a sudden he tells them that he's leaving. They don't want him to leave. The one that they love. They don't want to experience distance. And let me just tell you, long distance relationships are no fun. When Haley and I were dating, there was a period of our relationship that was long distance. And that was by far the worst period of our relationship. Long distance relationships are the worst. And our long distance relationship was like from here to Santa Clarita. It was like an hour and a half. And still, I was like an hour and a half is no fun. I do not like it. And here are the disciples. They want to be with the one that they love. And they're disappointed because they know Jesus is leaving them. And so he seeks to comfort them with the promise of his presence, which is interesting. Because how can he comfort them with the promise of his presence if they're disappointed that he's leaving? Like, you got to think about that, right? That doesn't seem to make sense. How can he say that he will always be with them when he's about to leave them? Well, go with me to John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, we see a great example of this where Jesus tells the disciples that he's leaving and their hearts are troubled and they're bothered by that and they don't like that and they're disappointed because of that. And Jesus says this in John 14, look at verse 18. He says to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. So he tells them that he's leaving, but then he says as he's leaving, I'm not going to leave you in a certain way, and the certain way is as orphans, which the idea there is you get left and they never return. So here Jesus is, and he's saying to his disciples, I'm about to leave, and I'm about to go back to my father, but you need to understand that it's not like I'm going to leave you like an orphan would be left. Okay, well, what does that mean? What is he talking about here? Jump back up to verse 16. Verse 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, or an advocate, or a counselor, or a friend, 
to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Or you could even translate that, and he is in you. So Jesus, you have to understand what he's saying here. Jesus can promise his presence, and one of the reasons why he can promise his presence is because the helper, or he even says here, the spirit of truth, the way that we often refer to him, the Holy Spirit is coming. And the Holy Spirit is coming to be with them, and not just be with them, but the Holy Spirit is coming to dwell or live inside of them. So there is nowhere that if you are a Christian, you can go where Jesus is not there. And one of the reasons why that's true is because every single Christian has the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. You could write this verse down in your handout. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So Jesus promises to his disciples that he's about to leave. I will always be with you. And one of the ways that we can know that's true is because he's going to ask the Father and the Father is going to send the helper. He's going to place his spirit now inside of his disciples. And every single Christian who has been saved by Jesus Christ has trusted in his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sins and has turned from their sins in repentance to now follow the Lord Jesus Christ, has the Holy Spirit living inside of them at all times and everywhere that they go. Jesus, he said something that's honestly crazy and sometimes hard to believe. Jesus himself even said that it's better to have the Spirit living inside of you than to have Jesus dwelling beside you. Like, look at what he said in John 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's hard for us to believe, and one of the reasons why it's hard for us to believe is because I think it would be pretty stinking awesome if everywhere I went today, Jesus was right beside me. Do you think that would be pretty cool? Well, Jesus says, hey, here's an advantage. I'm leaving, and because I'm leaving, the Holy Spirit is coming, and it's going to be better to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you every day, all the time, wherever you go, That is an advantage. So write this down on your handout. The spirit of Jesus lives inside of you. That promise is precious. And one of the reasons why is because it deals with the disappointment of distance. I don't know if you've ever felt this, but if you've ever felt like you wish you could just be with Jesus, here's what he says to you. Hey, right now, you've got the spirit living inside of you. Jesus is with you in the presence of his spirit. It's like Jesus is always with you in an actual spiritual sense. So it's not like you can see the Holy Spirit literally inside you. It's not like you can always feel tangibly the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He is a spirit. If we cut you open, the Holy Spirit isn't coming out. No, he's a spiritual presence, but it is like because he's a spiritual presence, Jesus is always with with you. So you could even write down next to that spiritual presence. That's one of the ways that I would encourage you. I'd want to teach you how to think about this, that Jesus is with you always in a spiritual presence kind of a way. The promise is also precious. And the second reason why is because of, and you got to think about this, the crushing weight 
that I'm sure the disciples felt when they heard the command. Because Jesus just told them to go and make disciples of all nations. And we've seen in Matthew 28 that some of these disciples are still even doubting him. There are some that are worshiping him. There are some that are doubting him. And not only that, but we even saw this through our study of the Gospel of Matthew. These are the same disciples that all deserted him when he was betrayed and arrested. So put yourself in their sandals for a second. Clearly these are guys who are fearful. Clearly these are guys who are not very loyal. Clearly these are guys that struggle with boldness. So if that was you, how would you feel when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Wouldn't you feel like, oh, how am I going to do that? I just denied you a couple nights ago. I just ran away from you a couple of days ago. For them to hear this command would feel crushing. How are they possibly going to do this? Well, because Jesus says that he's with them, they can find, keyword, confidence in his presence. I know some of you guys here tonight, you want to make disciples. The desire is there for you. You've shared that with me. You've shared that with your small group, but, but let's just get real here tonight. Some of you feel so alone at your school. You feel so alone where God has you. You feel like there is no one else who is really living for Christ. You might even feel like even those who claim to live for Christ don't seem to genuinely walk with the Lord. And because of that, you feel like, oh, man, this is just scary. And for some of you, you're like, not only is this scary, but it just feels impossible. I mean, with how many thousands of people there are all around me, with how many thousands of people go to my school every single day, sometimes it might feel like it is you against the entire world. And how am I going to make disciples of all nations when the sin at my school, when the sin in our community is just so great? How is this going to happen? It reminds me of a story, and I want you to see it. Let's all go to 2 Kings chapter 6. Everybody, grab your Bible and go with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. And if you feel disappointed by the low quality of movies that are being pumped out right now, I feel you. Do you feel that way ever? Like, bro, when are we going to get an actually good movie? Well, I've been saying this for years. And you could ask Jacob Upton because he's in my fellowship group. But I think... Like, they should make movies about the Bible and not try to, like, spiritualize them. Like, oh, let's, uh, let's, let's teach some lesson. No, like, just make the movie from the story. Because, watch, you'll see. This right here, this could be a movie. It's wild. You got to see it. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 8. It says, once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying... At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God, referring to Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. So basically what we just read in those short verses that the king of Syria wants to make war with Israel. He wants to come against them and he wants to make war with them. So he comes up with a secret location to set up his camp. The only problem is that Elijah, who is the man of God in verse 9, he knows this secret location. And the reason why he knows this secret location is not because he's a mole inside the armies of Syria, but just simply because he's a prophet. So God tells him where this secret location is going to be, and you know what he does? He warns the king of Israel, hey, don't go to this place because the king of Syria is going to be there and he wants to make war with you and he saves his life. Well, look at what happens in verse 11. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? So because the king of Syria's plan is ruined, he thinks, well, there's a traitor among them. So he gets one of the commanders of his army and he says, hey, tell me, which one among us is really for the king of Israel? Well, that's not the case. Look at verse 12. And one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, 
the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Sick. And he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. Well, it was told him, behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. So basically they say, hey, there's not a traitor. It's just this guy, Elisha. So the king of Syria sends a great army, it says, to go and find this one man. To the point where they march through the night to get to his house, to be there by surprise, and they end up surrounding the entire city that he lives in with this army. And here's what happens, verse 15. When the servant of the man of God, so this is not Elisha, this is his servant, rose early in the morning and went out, still probably in his jammies, rubbing the sleep out of his eyes. Behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? I mean, this is comical. Elijah's servant, it's like he's rolling out of bed. He walks outside. What does he see with bedheads still going on? The armies of Syria have completely surrounded their house. He's freaking out. He says this to Elijah. And look at what Elijah, Elisha says in verse 16. And he said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That sounds epic, but if you know the story, it's two guys versus a great army. So what are you talking about, Elisha? Then, verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. He says, those who are with us, even though there's only two guys, are more than those who are with them, even though there is a great army. Elisha's servant feels a very common feeling. He's afraid. And the reason why he's afraid is because he's focused on what he can see physically with his eyes. And I love what Elisha prays for him. Oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And you're thinking, he did see. That's why he's afraid. But the problem is he's focused on what he can see physically, not what he knows and should believe is true spiritually. And that's why Elisha prays, open up his eyes to see what is even more true. Yeah, there are a lot of people at your school that need to be reached. There are a lot of people in Huntington Beach that need to be saved. And you might feel like you are the only Christian who is really, truly, actually trying to live for Christ. You might feel like you're the only person who's really taken seriously getting this Christian club going at your campus. But here's what you have to know is true from God's word that I need us to see here tonight. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And you need your eyes opened to see how this promise can change the way that you feel. So write this down if you're taking notes. The armies of God surround you. The armies of God surround you. It was the Scottish reformer. I know most of you guys have probably never heard of him before, but his name's John Knox. He was a guy who God used in a great and mighty way in Scotland to see a revival happen there. He once prayed, and it's been recorded, that in the middle of the night, his wife woke up and her husband was gone. And the reason why is because he was in the next room down on his knees praying in the middle of the night because he couldn't sleep. And his wife heard him pray, give me Scotland or I die. Well, John Knox once said that a man with God is always in the majority. That even if it's just you against a thousand if it's you plus God, you are in the majority. You're not, out lo- you're not alone, and you're not outnumbered. Another way of thinking about this promise is that it's rooted in the character of God. And one of the things that this means is that we believe that our God is omnipresent, which means that our God, 
lives and dwells in all places at all times throughout all of history, that our God is everywhere all at once. And so what you can write down next to the armies of God surround you is you could write down spatial presence. You got spiritual presence and that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, but you've also got the spatial presence in that God is in all places at all times. His presence is constantly everywhere, even though you can't see it and even though you can't tangibly feel it, filling up the space. Here's a great verse. I love this one. Jeremiah 23, 24 says this, can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Like, hey, go try to find the most secretive place you possibly can. Can God not see you there? And it's not just that God can see you in all places. He says this, do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. So literally, there is nowhere you can go where God is not there. Write that down if you're taking notes here tonight for the truth that I want to present you with. There is nowhere you can go where God is not there. Jesus is promising that the Spirit lives inside of you. The Bible is teaching that God is in all places at all times. This is a part of what Jesus means when he promised, I will be with you. And by the way, the amount of times this promise of God's presence is given throughout the scripture is honestly overwhelming. Like God says over and over again, from beginning to end in the Bible, I will be with you. Here's just a couple examples of this. You could write these verses down on your handout. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 12, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said to Moses, I will be with you. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, God said, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. In Joshua 1, verse 9, God says to Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What about Psalm 23? Maybe one of the most epic psalms in all of the scripture, which says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's the one who makes me lie down in green pastures. He's the one who leads me beside still waters. He's the one who restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Isaiah 41, verse 10, God says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What about Hebrews 13, verse 5? Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I mean, this promise of God's presence is repeated over and over and over and over again throughout the scripture. And one of the reasons why is because sometimes our feelings are more real to us than the truth. And so God reminds us of the truth over and over and over again so that way we can learn how to inform our feelings to feel what is true, not just whatever we feel. And so I'm here to remind you of something very important tonight. Write this down for point number one. Don't believe the lie of loneliness. I know it might sound harsh. I know it might not be fun to stomach, but the truth of God's word is loneliness is a lie. You are never alone. That's the truth. Now I understand. We can believe the truths intellectually, which means you know it, you you choose to believe it, and yet at the same time still have moments where we feel lonely experientially. Like you just, you just do. And so what do you do on those days where you just feel sad? You just feel alone. How can you make sure that you don't follow your feelings, but rather you follow God's word? Go with me to Exodus chapter three in your Bibles. Exodus chapter three, everybody turn there with me. This is a famous passage because it's the story of Moses and the burning bush. But what this really is, is this is the call of Moses. This is when God appears to him 
and tells him that he is the man that God is going to use to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Look at Exodus chapter 3, pick it up with me in verse 7. Then Yahweh said to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. And you read that and you're like, dude, that's awesome. God is a God who hears the cries of his people. And so what is he going to do? He's going to deliver them. And he's going to get them out of Egypt. And he's going to bring them into this promised land that flows with milk and honey. And you think, yes, God, you're going to rescue your people. And then you get verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And here's what you have to understand. This is the way that our God works. God is the one, he makes it very clear, who is going to set his people free. But how is he going to do it? Through Moses. God is the one who is going to save the souls. But how is he going to do it? Through you. This is like the Old Testament Great Commission. God's telling Moses, hey, I'm going to save my people. But Moses, I want you to go. And I want you to open up your mouth to Pharaoh. And look at what Moses says, verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? You know what Moses does? He does what we do. He begins to make excuses. He begins to give reasons why he thinks, Oh, no, not, not, not me. I... I, I, I can't do that. I, I'm not adequate. I'm not able. I'm not equipped. This isn't something for me to do. God, I'm not prepared for this. And what are his excuses rooted in? He's focused on himself. What does he say in verse 11? Notice it. Who am I? He's thinking about himself. He doesn't feel adequate He doesn't feel like he's the right person for the job. That's not the only excuse that he makes. Look down at verse 13. It says in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? There's another common excuse. He's not sure how he would respond if they ask him a question. He's like, What if I don't have all the right answers? I want to make sure I know exactly what to say before I go. Drop down to chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. What does Moses feel like? Here's another common excuse. The people aren't going to listen to me. Why would they listen to me? I've got, I've got no real reasons why they would listen to me. No, this is not my job. This is your job. This is not something for me. Look at verse 10. Exodus chapter 4. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. I don't speak well. Either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Here's a common excuse. I'm not good at public speaking. I'm not good at talking to people. I'm not good at talking in front of people. Moses doesn't feel like he can speak well. What do we get? Excuse after excuse after excuse. And I just want to make it very clear. I am sure that some of these are legit. Like, I don't want to just write them off like, oh, Moses, come on, man. No, I am sure that some of these are legitimate ways that he genuinely feels. But what are they? Excuses. God has called him to do something, and he is allowing the way that he feels to get in the way of obedience. Does that happen in your life? Has God called you to do something and you allow the way that you feel to get in the way of obedience? And I'm not minimizing the way that you feel. I'm sure that some of the excuses that you've given in the past are genuinely the way that you feel and it's genuinely like how you think. In the words of, here's a great quote, in the words of the German theologian, his name was Sven, when he was talking to his European disciple, a guy named Christoph, in the classic work of Frozen 2, 
He says, you feel what you feel and your feelings are real. You heard that one before? But here's what you need to know. Your feelings are not God. God is God. And at some point, you need to learn how to obey God despite what you feel. So how does God reassure Moses in this situation? Look back at Exodus 3, verse 12. He said, but I will be with you. The promise of God's presence is meant to help Moses just like it's meant to help you. Let me preach a super unpopular message today for just a minute. There are going to be times where you do not feel like obeying and you need to anyways. The reason why that's a super, super unpopular message today is because people today in the church that are so focused on their feelings and their, the way that they feel, they call that legalism. It's not. It's called obedience is what it's called. There are times where I don't feel like obeying. There are times when I know the promise, and honestly, it feels like it makes little difference in my life. There are times in my life where the way that I feel is more real to me than what I know to be true is, and the temptation on those days and in those moments is to make excuses. And you need to know here tonight that obedience is a choice, and you can choose it despite how you feel. And the choice of obedience, while sometimes it's hard and it's difficult, it is always best. Every single time. And so let me ask you, what are your excuses and who do you need to share them with? Hey, write this down on your notes. What excuses do I make when it comes to obedience? And let me encourage you here tonight to share those with your small group this Thursday and to pray for one another about those excuses. Now, there's more good, good news in our passage. So let's go back to Matthew 28 one last time because there's one aspect of this promise that I need you to carefully see before we end our time together here tonight. Go back to Matthew 28 and let's just look at it again. The preciousness of this promise, the last little line at the end of verse 20. This is all we're talking about here tonight. I'm trying to help these words come to life in your heart here tonight. Jesus says, Matthew 28, last line, verse 20, I am with you always. And then this is the line that I need you to carefully see to the end of the age. Now you might read that. You might think nothing of that. You might think, oh, cool, Jesus is with me always at all times and all places to the end of the age. So that's just like forever and ever, right? No, I want you to actually think about that. What does he mean when he says to the end of the age? Because that seems like this promise has an expiration date. Like he's saying, I'm going to be with you until we get to the end of the age. I'll be with you always, and then the end of the age is going to come. What? What is the end of the age? Well, go with me to Matthew 13 in your Bibles. Go back to Matthew 13 because this phrase is repeated over and over again throughout the Gospel of Matthew, the end of the age, and we don't have time to look at all of the examples of how it's used. Let me just show you one example of how it's used, the end of the age. When is the end of the age? And whatever that is, does that mean that Jesus will not be with us anymore when the end of the age comes? Look at Matthew 13, Verse 47, Jesus tells a parable talking about the kingdom of heaven. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and it gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and they sat down and they sorted the good into containers, but they threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and they will separate the evil from the righteous and they will throw them into the fiery furnace, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the end of the age, according to Jesus, is the time of judgment. It's the time at the end of the world when Jesus and the angels are going to come out, and they're going to separate the evil from the righteous, the sheep from the goats, and they're going to throw the evil into the lake of fire, and then they're going to bring the righteous into God's presence in a place called the new Jerusalem, to be with him forever and ever. And when will the end of the age come? According to this parable, when the net is full. When the net is full, when all of those whom God has chosen to save from eternity past are saved, then the time of judgment will come. The wicked will be condemned. The righteous will shine. 
that's the end of the age. It's the time of judgment. Okay, so when judgment comes, does that mean Jesus will no longer be with us? What is this talking about? How do we think about this? Go with me to one last passage, unless you don't want to be encouraged. If you don't want to be encouraged, don't go to this passage, okay? If you want to be encouraged, go with me to Revelation 21, which is probably one of the stupidest things I've ever said, because you're like, uh, Shane, you didn't need to say that. Like, just tell us to turn to Revelation 21. Of course, like, it doesn't even matter if we want to be encouraged or not. We're here at church, dude. We got our Bibles. Like, we're just following along. We'll go to Revelation 21. <laughs> Everybody go to Revelation 21. Start with me in verse 1. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And I don't know if you know this, but Revelation 21 comes after Revelation 20. And if you look back at Revelation 20, and you see the heading above verse 11, it says judgment before the great white throne. So we just finished up a period of judgment. Now we get the new heavens and the new earth coming down out of heaven, and you get the new Jerusalem. And in this new Jerusalem, there is a reality. And the reality of it is that God will be there, and he will dwell there, and he will live there. And not only will God be there, but so will his people. So when Jesus says, I am with you always to the end of the age, what he's saying is, hey, I'm going to be with you guys spiritually and spatially until the end of the age. And then when the end of the age comes, loneliness will finally and fully come to an end because he's going to be with us physically, in the new Jerusalem. Write this down for point number two here tonight. I want to encourage you to look forward to the end of loneliness. There is coming a day, and this is the good news, when you will be with Jesus, and Jesus will be with you. This is not spatial presence, like God just exists in all places at all times. This is not spiritual presence, like the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, but you can't feel him tangibly. This is physical presence. Jesus will actually be there. You will actually be there. Because that's a day that you and I, we should look forward to. That's a day that you and I should get excited about. I, uh, I started premarital counseling with a couple here at our church this past week. They're getting married next summer, and uh, I'm going to be doing the wedding. It's out in Oregon, and at the end of our meeting, I said to them, hey, I know that the wedding is next summer, but do you know how many days there are until it happens? And right away, both of them shouted out a number of days. And the reason why it's because even though the day when they're joined together in marriage still feels like, at least to me, it's so far away, they both in their minds have a countdown of how many days it is until we get married. And the reason why is because they're looking forward to it. They're excited about it. Even though the reality still feels like it's a ways off, well, they can't wait. They want it to be here. I understand what that student meant when the small group leader hung up and they said, ugh, I'm jealous. I can't wait to be married and not lonely anymore. Because when I was engaged, if you asked me, what are you most excited for about getting married? I would have told you without batting an eye, I can't wait to stop saying goodbye. That was the thing that I was most excited for. And the reason why is because when Haley and I were dating, I hated spending time with Haley, having so much fun, and at the end of our time together, having to say goodbye and go our separate ways. I always just wanted to be with her. I always just wanted us to be together. And at the same time, I also totally understand what the small group leader meant when they said, what, you think just because I'm married I never get lonely? 
The reason why is because this Tuesday, Haley and I celebrate our wedding anniversary. We've been, yeah, one guy's excited about us being married. No, you don't have to clap. You don't have to, you don't have to clap. We've been, we've been married for seven years. And like, I can just tell you, although these have been the best seven years of my life by far, there are still times where both of us have felt the feelings of loneliness. It's like there is this reality in this world where we can be together and yet still feel lonely. In many ways, the Christian life, it can feel similar. Like you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you. That is a reality. So wherever you go, Jesus is with you in the form of his spiritual presence. God is omnipresent. That is a truth. So like literally, there's nowhere you can go where God is not there in a spatial, actual sense. You're never alone. And yet, if we're being real here tonight, you feel alone sometimes, right? Am I the only one? See, that's why we look forward. Because Revelation 19 tells us there's a wedding day coming. When Jesus returns, he will come to be with you physically, literally, forever and ever. You will be with him in his presence, and he will be with you in your presence, never ever to be separated. And so wherever you find yourself here today, that is a day that we look forward to. Let's pray.